Hello everyone, my name is uh, Gregory Balam, a financial aid technician here at Moore Park College. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you guys about uh, financial literacy. Okay, so some of the objectives I kind of want to go through with you guys. Uh, well, firstly is I want you guys to be able to understand what being financially literate means. Um, during my educational career at Cal State University Northridge, I never once heard this term at all. Um, if anyone had told me uh, or described to me financial literacy, I wouldn't have had a single clue to what it was. Um, so when I started working on financial literacy um, here at this campus, it was completely brand new to me. So as I kind of went through it, I had to kind of pick up things and learn um, step by step, and I'm kind of hoping that you guys will also be able to do that exact same thing with it. Um, second, I want you guys to learn about ways you can start to manage your finances in um, smart ways. Um, I can be the first to admit that I'm not uh, always smart about my spending choices. There are times when I can go out, I eat food, um, and I purchase things when I don't necessarily need to do those things, when I could be saving, different things like that. Um, so what you need to realize, though, is you have to make smart purchases. So that's what I also want to go through as well. And lastly, but probably most importantly, is I want you guys to be able to identify uh, tools and resources that you can use to continue being financially literate and to make sure that you can manage your money in smart, effective ways. Um, I don't want anyone to feel overwhelmed by financial literacy. It kind of sounds like kind of like a complicated term, but we do have a lot of tools and resources that are available to you guys um, that can help you and facilitate that learning process. Um, so what I want to start off with uh, is what is financial literacy? Of course, that's probably the most important thing to ask before you dive into any subject. Um, and basically what financial literacy is, your ability to make informed decisions and to take effective actions regarding your current and future use and management of your money. So in other words, it's your ability to make smart choices um, about your money for long-term and short-term goals. Um, and this can include buying choices. Now, necessarily, buying choices don't necessarily include um, buying food, buying clothes. It can also include money management, budgeting, and saving. In addition, it also includes life choices, um, such as you know, paying housing, unemployment, bills, and um, of course, paying for children if you have kids. Okay, so you may be asking yourself now, well, why should I be financially literate? Um, well, unless you're a business or a economic major, you may not uh, actually fully um, recognize what financial literacy might be. And even if you are one of those majors, you may not have gone through that if it's not part of your curriculum for your subjects in class. So what happens is the average student who enters college lacks basic skills in management of per and of personal financial affairs. So the average student doesn't really know how to budget their money um, and what they can do to increase their savings account. Um, and many are unable to balance a checkbook and, miss, and most simply have no insight into the basic survival principle involved in earning, spending, uh, and saving as well as um, investing their money. Now investing is an important one. Um, when I went through university, I did not know anything about investing. I didn't know what mutual bonds were, stocks, those kind of things. And even to a certain extent right now, I'm not as uh, familiar as I probably could be. Um, but that's why we're going to go through tools later on as well. Um, and I'm just going to throw some statistics out as well. According to the 2014 Financial Literacy Survey conducted by the National Foundation for Credit Counseling, 61% of U.S. adults admit to not having a, a budget, even though a budget is considered a building block of financial stability. This is the highest percentage in six years. So when you put that into context, you can see that three out of five adults do not make a budget or do not create a budget. Um, and what you also want to, what I also want to emphasize is if you look at the slide, that's only the adults that admit to, do it, to doing it. So who knows what it, actually the number is or what the percentage could be. Um, in addition, most adults have not reviewed their credit score, uh, about 60%, or their credit report, 65% for that, within the past 12 months. Um, I think most of you guys know what credit report is and what a credit score uh, represents, but in case you haven't heard it, it's basically an index for your credit worthiness. So paying off bills, um, paying your mortgage, rent, any of those things will adversely affect or um, it will uh, benefit it as well. Um, so you want to be aware of what's going on with your credit score. Okay, so this last slide was statistics. I don't want to bore, bore you guys too, many, too much with statistics, but the last one I felt was uh, relevant as well. But the seventh annual financial literacy survey of U.S. adults conducted in 2013 on behalf of the National Foundation for Credit Counseling revealed that 78% uh, agree that they could benefit from additional advice to answers to everyday financial questions. So if you have questions about it and you have staff that are available to help you, why not seek the answers, right? I mean, you would want to 
kind of help your financial future as well. Um, in addition, 57% uh, indicated that they're worried over a lack of savings, including 43% who are concerned about not having enough rainy day savings for an emergency, and 38% uh, that are concerned about retiring with enough money set aside. So that's uh, a little bit staggering because, of course, um, when you're younger, you don't really look at your long-term um, savings account. You think, well, I'm young, I can always do that later, but in fact, that could adversely affect your future. Um, in terms of your retirement and making sure you have enough money to, uh, well, retire without, you know, working. So at this point, you may be asking yourself, what can I do? And um, luckily, there's a lot of things you can do, but the first thing I want to start off in kind of emphasizing is the resources or tools that you use to, be st to become financially literate or to manage your money well. Okay? So the first tool that I want to go over is something called Cash Course. Um, now, Cash Course is a free online tool. It's relatively new to our campus. Uh, I believe I started working with the program uh, maybe mid-semester in the spring semester. So actually, just last spring, we just barely started. So something's relatively new, but it is something I definitely want to emphasize to all students because it's provided free of charge to all students. All you have to do is set up an account, and then you can access all the resource tools. So um, to kind of summarize what Cash Course does, it's basically a free online resource that equips students with tools to help them track spending, uh, create a budget, understand how their current decisions will affect their fu uh, future financial well-being, and helps you find scholarships as well. Um, the site contains links to multiple databases for scholarships, so I definitely want to emphasize that that is important to look over as well. Um, it also provides tips for finding part-time jobs. It also has scenarios where it'll kind of show you what to expect from an interview. So um, if you need to find a part-time job while in school, it kind of gives you resources for that as well. Um, and lastly, it shows you how to look at investment options. Like, again, I said, uh, that's the one I'm most unfamiliar with, but this has a lot of resources that help you um, determine whether mutual bonds, stocks, um, are best for you. Okay, and so I just want to kind of go through Cash Course a little bit more. There are a lot of in-depth topics. Um, it has a lot of pre-test, post-testing that help you become knowledgeable with specific topics. For example, if you look at the slide, there's one that says, uh, um, be credit savvy basically informs you about ways that you can help or hurt uh, your credit score as well as keep track of your credit report. So they give you a lot of resources on what you can do with that. Um, in addition, it also provides budgeting basics. So if you've never created a budget or you don't know how to start, it tells you what you can do to get started on budgeting as well as it provides worksheets and it basically does a mock budget for you as well. Uh, and then another example is getting started with savings plus investing. It describes the types of investments you can make and how to save, how to look at savings accounts. Uh, there's always, of course, uh, interest rates uh, or interest percentages for savings account where you can get more money off of it. So it tells you how to look for those type of things. In addition, it also shows you how to find specific answers to problems. So this is one of the easier parts of Cash Course. Basically, there's a drop down menu, as you can see right there. And you can ask it a question that you have. So it kind of summarizes, uh, or kind of has a good amount of questions that most students would ask. Um, so if you want to say, uh, how could I spend less? It gives you specifics on how to budget and how to adjust for changes in income. So I think that's an important aspect because a lot of times if you're going to school, if you get accepted into a nursing program or something, you have to work less hours because it's a really intensive program. It shows you how you can kind of take that into account to adjust your budget as well. Um, it also provides you saving um, tips for saving money um, on food, household items, each one of those things, so it kind of goes through a grocery list of items and it tells you what you can do to save money on those items. Um, and in addition, if you want to also say, how should I invest my money, it'll provide you information, again, on mutual funds, stocks, bonds, retirement, as well as all those different types of things. And lastly, the last example I had was, if you want to find money for college, it's also really important um, to access Cash Course because it talks to you about financial aid basics. Um, again, it helps you find scholarships, um, and it helps you look at loan options as well. So it provides a lot of different resources in terms of financial aid as well, and I want to emphasize scholarships because although some students have no financial aid, they do a, a free application for federal student aid, and it shows that they are not eligible for financial aid, they can of course always look at loan options, but of course scholarships is money you do not have to pay back, so that's really important to look at that resource before looking at your loan options as well. Okay, another resource as well. Um, it isn't as thorough as Cash Course, but it is another tool that I do want to make sure you guys are aware of. Is we do have something through our MoorparkCollege.edu website. Um, and if you go to the financial aid department homepage, there is a way you can access financial aid online services and access online financial aid counseling. 
And if you look right there, I'm not sure if it's readable from there, but it has a couple of different things for credit cards, uh, credit scoring, um, saving money, those type of things. So kind of just basically reinforce all that information that hopefully you probably learned on Cash Course as well. Let's see if this works. Uh, let's see if they get to a slide. Let's see. Okay. I'm not sure there it is. Okay. So um, what you can do now, once you have these kind of resources, you can help to develop a financial game plan. Um, so what I would recommend always doing first is separating your needs from your wants. Of course, needs are necessities for everyday living and goal attainment. This also includes your educational goals as well, so that is part of a need. So um, knowing what money you need for books and that kind of thing, you're obviously going to need to allocate a certain amount of funds for that. Um, and of course, wants are things that are nice to have but are not necessary. A lot of students uh, kind of confuse the two. A lot of people would like to consider some of their wants, needs, but they aren't necessarily that. So it's important to help distinguish between the two. Another question you want to ask yourself uh, is, what do you need to survive while in school versus what you might merely want or desire? OK, so again, just kind of emphasize it. Uh, separate your needs from your wants. Uh, needs, of course, are generalizations, so it doesn't always uh, hold true for every aspect or every category. But needs are generally fixed expenses, um, such as rent or mortgage, utilities, food, clothing, and transportation, taxes, health care, and child care expenses that you have to pay either monthly or weekly, however it would work. Um, and wants are generally variable expenses, such as entertainment, cable, internet service, magazine, eating out, hobbies, and cell phones. Um, remember, while internet is something that's absolutely necessary probably for school at this point, um, there are a lot of ways you can access it without having to pay for it. Of course, you can always utilize the learning resource, the library. Um, there's a lot of different places where you can access the internet. So that's always an option for you to um, do if you're tied on your expenses. Um, and remember, what you don't want to do is you don't want to spend on wants unless you can cover your needs. So your needs always take top priority over your wants. So keep that in mind. OK, so um, why is it important to separate needs and wants? Well, let's look at a couple of uh, potential spending scenarios. So if you buy a Starbucks drink every day, you could be potentially spending $3.50 a day on that. If you make that into a weekly expense, it's going to equal $24.50 a week. And then if you do it yearly, that is $1,227.50. And that is a good amount of money that you could be potentially using on your savings account on investing, on a lot of other different things that might benefit your financial well-being in the future. Um, lastly, I'm not sure if anyone goes Sonic Burger. I like Sonic Burger, but it's there. Um, there is, if you buy a burger at 425, again, in a week, that adds up to 29.75. A year is $1,551.25. Even if you don't go to Sonic Burger, let's say you go to In-N-Out, usually you'll buy a meal. It's going to be around the same price, and especially if you're going out to multiple different fast food locations, or, I don't know, sit-down restaurants, that certainly adds up. So that just kind of gives you an idea of what the expense would look like. Um, and again, last uh, kind of scenario is if you buy a carton of cigarettes at $32, let's say um, you only buy a pack um, a month, then it's going to equal $384. Of course, that's not so realistic for those who smoke. Um, usually it's bi-weekly, so if you look at the expenses for a year, you're looking at $832 a year. So again, all of the expenses, even though they may seem small when you're paying for it, they do add up if you consistently go out and purchase those things. OK, so what you want to take out of that is you want to make smart choices about your spending. You always want to take into consideration your short-term financial goals as well as your long-term goals. Um, you want to develop a financial plan, but set realistic goals for financing and completing your education. You want to make a budget and stick to it. And I want to emphasize, if you do consider loans, um, you want to borrow only what you need. A lot of students, what they do, especially when they come, I'm, I'm from financial aid, what they come is they just want to um, ask for the max amount. And that may necessarily not work for them, depending on what their career is and what their goals are in the future. So I always want to take consideration that you only want to borrow what you need. So once you've kind of organized your needs and wants and you have a specific kind of financial plan in your head, the next thing to do is uh, create a monthly budget. What you want to do is you want to start at the beginning of each month. You want to pay yourself. Now, pay yourself doesn't mean buy yourself a nice set of clothes or anything like that. What pay yourself really means is you want to open a savings account and you want to put money into that savings account. You're paying yourself for the future, basically. Um, 
And you also want to keep track of everything you spend. So if you do spend money on coffee, newspaper, you want to keep track of everything. That way you can have an accurate budget to project and uh, save your money. Um, you also want to record all of your income, of course. You can't really determine a budget without knowing what your income is or how much money is coming in on a monthly basis. And most importantly, you want to pay all your bills on time. Now, specifically, this says create a monthly budget. I would say that's kind of uh, up to you, depending on what is the best course of action for yourself. For example, if you work bi-weekly, maybe you want to make a bi-weekly uh, uh, budget. Of course, monthly works maybe necessarily for me because I get paid once a month. I can look at all my expenses at that point, all my bills and everything. But again, it may not work for you if you get paid weekly or bi-weekly. You can always adjust that. Okay. So when you're making that budget, there are a lot of different things to consider. Uh, so you want to consider the unexpected. Of course, things happen. Um, you might get in a car accident. You might have to pay for car repairs. Uh, the cost of gas constantly is fluctuating up and down, so that's important to take into consideration, as well as unexpected emergencies such as health care costs that may um, happen over time as well. You want to make sure that you have um, something separated in your budget in order to account for those situations. Um, so you want to, like I said, again, assess your needs and expenses first. Um, prioritize whatever dollars are left over and then track your actual expenses as compared to with your budget. Are you on track? Do you want to consistently look at that and see, are you on track? So once you have that in, uh, set in stone, you want to start saving and bank wisely. So of course, if you don't have a savings account, you definitely want to start a savings account. Um, and if you're employed and your employer offers a retirement plan, you want to start looking at that as well right away. If you start your retirement plan early, you're going to have more money in there by the time you retire. Um, and of course, I just want to keep emphasizing, borrow only what you need if you do need to borrow loans. Um, one of the things you can do for your savings account is you can sign up for automatic savings. A lot of times it's automatic. I have that on my savings account. I get $50 transferred from my checking account into my savings account every month. It helps because it kind of just is automatic. You don't have to look at it and it just it works out that way. You don't have to look at it. Okay, so to kind of give you an idea of how a savings account may work to your benefit, here's a, basically a table showing you what the effects of, of compounding interest will do to your bank account. So this is, just so you're for your knowledge, this is based on 4% uh, interest. Um, so if you save $50 a month, in about 10 years, that's going to become $7,387. If you actually calculate how much interest you're actually getting on that, that's actually an additional $1,387 you're getting just for having the money in that bank account. Um, if you uh, save more than that, $250 a month, then in 10 years, that's going to be $36,935. And if you calculate the interest again for that, that's going to be $6,935 that you're just be going to be getting in interest just for having that in your bank account as well. And then there's another example, $500 a month. Of course, this may not be realistic for everyone, but just to give you guys, a, um, just to emphasize how important it is to know uh, how much interest your savings account has. If you do $500 a month, that's in 10 years, $73,870 or $13,870 of uh, interest that's going on your savings account. Okay, so what you want to use when you are uh, trying to figure out how to do savings or start saving money is you want to use this uh, model called the SMART model. Now what the SMART model means is you have S for specific. You want to be specific when you save money. Certain, just basically saying that you're going to save money every month is not enough. What you want to do is you want to say, hey, I'm going to save $40 a month. That way you have a specific amount that you have that you keep track of. Um, you also want to make sure it's measurable. Um, you want to save $40 every month. Is, it, that is measurable, but you want to make sure you're measuring it on a week to, at least to a week to week basis. So you want to see, okay, let me save $10 every month. That way you're measuring it on a weekly basis rather than a monthly basis. It's more than likely if you do it that way that you'll actually succeed at doing your goal. Um, and you also want to make sure it's attainable. You need to make sure that you can afford, uh, let's say in this example, $10 a month. If you can't afford it, then there's no reason. It's, you're basically setting yourself up to fail. You want to be able to save the amount that your goal indicates. Um, so if it's real, more realistic, um, which is the next one, to save five or eight dollars a month, then you want to do that. You want to look at all your expenses and look at what you want to spend your money on. It, I mean, it's okay for you to save a little bit of money to go ahead and spend on going out a little bit, but you want to make sure you set your priorities, that way you can adjust that amount. And then, like I said, that was uh, realistic. And then you also want to make sure it's time sensitive. Setting a goal of $10 a week is, is, is pretty good, um, but what you can do to enhance that is you can say that I'm going to save $10 every Friday of every week. So that way you have a specific deadline, because again, if you set a deadline for yourself, you're more than likely to succeed at doing that. 
Okay, so what I want to talk about a little bit is I want to also, like I said, loans is kind of a last resort thing, but if you need to, I would want to kind of, kind of inform you guys about the federal direct loans that we offer here um, through financial aid. And there are two different types of loans. There's a subsidized loan. Um, generally, this is considered the better one because while you're in college, um, at least six units, and before you graduate, you have no interest accumulating on that loan. So that's generally more beneficial to the student because as long as you're in college, you can just focus on college. Don't worry about interest uh, piling up on that loan. Um, now, there's also another one called unsubsidized loan, and that's basically, you consider it basically the opposite of that. And that is, as soon as you take it out, you get interest accumulating on it right away. So what I would usually recommend students is if they have to take an unsubsidized loan is try to at least pay off the interest while you're in school. It's a very important thing to do. And if you're going to continue your, ed in your education, let's say you have a subsidized loan and you want to continue your education after you graduate, as long as you're in six units, you can always defer the loan. That way, the government will continue to pay your interest while you're in school. So even though you have, you've graduated, you can still have that interest paid for if you're in at least six units, OK? OK, again, you want to borrow only what you need for school. There's a couple of different financial facts here. But getting an education is expensive, um, especially if you don't receive financial aid. It can definitely pile up. And especially when you go to the four-year university, there's going to be a lot of it's going to exponentially get larger the amount that it costs for education. So what you need to do is you need to know what you're financing. You want to estimate your income. So look up your career. Um, see what the average income is yearly and see how much you could realistically um, borrow through loans if you have to do that. And remember, whatever you borrow, you have to pay it back. That's why, of course, it's called a loan. You have to pay it back. Um, and then your loan also stays on your credit history. So. If you default on it, it shows up on there. If you have late payments, then it's going to affect your credit score. So you want to make sure you stay on top of your loan obligations. Oops. Okay. So now that we talked a little bit about credit, um, how do you establish good credit? It's important to know this as well. Um, of course, you want to pay off your credit balances in full. Of course, that may not always be realistic. The next little point says if you can't make it, then it make at least a minimum payment. I wouldn't even recommend that. I would say if you can't pay it in full, you want to pay as much as possible over the, the actual minimum payment because especially if you have high balances, that minimum payment over time is going to cost you a lot of money. So the last resort for this would be to make the minimum payment. I would always say don't do that if, uh, if you don't have to do that. Um, of course, pay your bills on time. If you, pay it, um, if you don't pay it on time, it's going to show a derogatory mark on your credit report. And of course, don't overcharge. Do not charge or exceed as much as your limit allows. Um, of course, that looks negatively at your credit score, um, as well as even, for example, on my credit score, if you have over about 3 quarters of your balance full, or 75%, that still shows up as a derogatory mark, because they want to see that you can have it under control. And generally, I would say that below 50% might be viewed a little bit better. So not even having it uh, at the limit, but even a little bit below the limit affects it as well. OK, so how do I access my credit report? A lot of the different um, credit agencies, such as Equifax, TransUnion, Experian, um, they charge you if you go onto their website to monitor it, to have credit alerts and everything. But there is a free online resource that you could ch uh, do or you could check out yearly. And this is the website for it. It's uh, www.annualcreditreport.com. I definitely would advise you to write that down if that's something you want to look into. Like I said, it's free, and you can check that yearly. And that does, in fact, also check all three credit, uh, major credit agencies. So like in Equifax, TransUnion, Experian, all, all three of those. OK, so what happens when I have bad credits? Well, you may not be able to rent an apartment. Most apartments nowadays, they check for credit scores. Um, you may not be able to buy a house, purchase a car. You may not be able to uh, obtain other forms of credit. Now, of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that you won't get it you could potentially still get those things. However, if you do, you're going to likely have a high interest rate on those accounts. So it's very beneficial for you to, like I said, monitor it and make sure you're doing everything you can to make sure that credit risk score is as high as possible. It's definitely going to benefit you in the future. It's basically like getting a bad grade. It stays on your permanent record. The credit report, basically, it stays on there. You get to view it. It's going to be on there for a while. OK. What I also want to emphasize is find additional resources. So support from family. A lot of people don't like to ask their family for help. I would recommend doing that, especially if it helps you stay out of debt. You want to make sure that you exhaust all possible um, avenues of, of income. That way, you don't uh, get in debt. 
Of course, you want to apply for financial aid. Even if you don't think you're going to qualify, you want to apply for financial aid, especially since even if you don't qualify, if you try and look into federal direct loans, you need to have a, a FAFSA on, online or on file for us to process a loan application as well. Again, scholarships, even if you don't apply for, or even if you apply for financial aid and you don't qualify, loans are available as well as scholarships. And I definitely want to emphasize that Cash Corps is a resource that you can use to access those databases. Um, in addition, um, you can definitely look at employment. Um, there's part-time employment. I would, I would recommend that if you don't have to work, I would not work. I would say uh, if you don't have to, try to concentrate on school as much as possible. It's always beneficial. It's something that my engineering professor told me when I was at CSUN. He said the first thing he told me was, if you don't have to work, do not work. It is more beneficial for your educational career to not work. But of course, that may not always be realistic, so if you do, you know, look at part-time employment, look at work-study, which is a part of financial aid, or do internships. Um, there are some internships that are available that could potentially help your educational career also while paying you as well for it. So definitely look at those things as well. And of course, last resort, like I said, uh, are student loans. You only want to borrow what you need for that. Okay? okay. So I want to see if you guys have any questions about what I've gone over. I've tried to leave a little bit of time. That way we can kind of go over some questions. Um, regarding anything you guys need to know, loans, uh, uh, anything about financial literacy. Does anybody have any questions about anything? Yes, go ahead. Hi, um, are there any resources on this campus that can help in financial planning? Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, we do offer a cash course for students that are uh, that are, are attending college right now, so I would definitely recommend that you can try out cash course if you want, we can always make an appointment. You can meet with me. I'm in the financial aid office, and we can go step by step. As well as, we do offer financial literacy workshops uh, through financial aid every semester. The next one, I believe, is on November. Let me see. I think I have it here. I want to say it's November 24th. Let me see if I have it. Yeah, here it is. It will be November 24th, which is a Tuesday between 1 and 2. But even if you're unable to attend those, you can always uh, follow up with me, and I can kind of go with you step by step as well as uh, the online financial uh, counseling as well, like I showed you earlier, is another resource you can use. Of course, um, for our ear wellness, uh, what we're doing our presentation series here, we're also going to have additional um, speeches as well that will go kind of more in depth with everything, such as budgeting and everything. So we'll have a couple of other things that we'll be offering through the college as well. Do you guys have any other questions? Yes. So the, um, all right. With the rising cost of college, um, OK. With the rising cost of college, um, how can one afford to go to for your university? Well, you definitely want to look at your financial aid options. Of course, you want to do your, your free application for federal student aid or your FAFSA application. You want to do it early. Ideally, you want to do it before March 2nd because potentially what you can be eligible for is uh, the federal Pell Grant as well as Cal Grant. Now, the Cal Grant is really important for those students that are transferring if you're already receiving it, especially, or if you want to apply for it as well. Because here at the community college level, you're looking at about 1600 a year for the Cal Grant. But when you go to Cal State, you're, it's going to exponentially go up. I want to say it's about eight, nine thousand dollars. I can always verify that later if you want to like meet with me or anything like that. So it ex exponentially goes up. As well as you also just want to look at your financial aid department, depending on where you want to transfer, because they do have institutional grants sometimes, or other things that may help you with tuition costs and those kind of things. So you want to basically always inquire with your financial aid office to see what is available to you. Of course, loans are always a possibility if you want to do that. But like I said, last resort kind of thing, you, would you want to do that, OK? Um, are there any other questions with that? OK. What I want to leave you with is basically, um, this is our office hours for financial aid. Is that basically, they are the same as me as well. Um, so Monday and Thursday, we have 8 to 5. Tuesday and Wednesday, we have between 8 and 7. And Friday, we have between 8 and 12. Um, and here's our phone number for financial aid. There's my email. Um, what I would suggest is if you have more questions regarding financial literacy, again, we have that financial literacy workshop between, on November 24th between, uh, what time was it? Let me see. Sorry about that. Between 1 and 2. And that's in Fountain Hall 117. Um, and of course, right now what we're doing with the financial aid workshop is right now they're kind of a general overview. Like I said, it's kind of a brand new kind of program that we have right now. Um, and what we'll be having maybe next semester is I want to try to kind of specify them where we do go over just budgeting or just credit or just investing as well. 
So you want to look out for that. We always post our workshop schedule online at the Financial Aid Department homepage, um, and it's available to everyone. Um, so do you guys have any other questions besides that? That's basically what I have for my presentation. Um, I would suggest, of course, creating an account at Cash Course, as well as setting up an account also through uh, the Financial Aid Counseling homepage. Again, if you guys have any questions with that, you can always come into my office, and we can, we can talk about that further. Okay? All right. Thank you, guys.